Hello and welcome to Before Our Friends Die. You're joined by me, Kavan. Me, Rash. And this is the podcast where we have the conversations we want to have before we leave this planet. This week, we're joined by a very, very special set of guests. One of them is my former lecturer when I studied my sociology degree, Associate Professor Jane Pilcher. And she is joined by Hannah Deakin Smith from the Nottingham Trent University. It's really a pleasure to have them here today to discuss a topic which is close to our hearts. You know. Rochelle and I have names that are often, um, how should we say it? Butchered. 100%. Mispronounced. Yep. Said wrong. 100%. Spelt wrong. Yeah. How does it make you feel? I, I get Rachel a lot. You get Rachel? Yeah, I get Rachel a lot. That's why for some, for the past couple of years when I started or oh, finished uni, like professional job, I just went with Rash. Wow. Yeah. But we get to that, I guess. So how does that make you feel? <laughs> to me, it doesn't, doesn't really phase me, to be honest. Okay. No, it doesn't really phase me. Interesting. Mm. Well, that's what we're here today to discuss. And uh, without further ado, let's go. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for joining us, Jane and Hannah. Really, really appreciate it. Um, first of all, how are you both doing? Jane, we'll good, start with you. you. Good. Yeah, good. Thank you. Wicked. So, like I said at the start, you know, this episode is a personal one for us. We both have names that people tend to m- mispronounce. Um, you know, all the time, as, as recently as today at work, my name got butchered once or twice. Um, so let's let's start with with you, Jane. What is what is your name, and um, what does it mean? So my name is Jane 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 Pilcher. So Jane being my first name, Pilcher being my kind of surname or family name, as it's sometimes called. So Jane has a meaning derived from the name John. So Jane is technically a feminine form of John and John itself derives from a Hebrew name which means something like grace of God but I'm sure none of those none of those were reasons why I was called Jane it was just when I was born in in, in 1965 Jane was a top 10 name for girls and I think that's why my parents probably chose it it was kind of like you know a trend at that time yeah Um, my surname is what's known as an occupational surname because it it uh, derives from like way back. Apparently, Pilcher, a Pilcher, was a person who cleaned and scraped animal skins. So a Pilch was an animal skin. So somewhere back in the distant past, my relatives were were scrapers of animal skins, which is a bit <laughs> ironic given that I'm now vegetarian. But you know, years have passed since then, so I kind of got to let that one go. Hannah, what can you tell us about your name? So I'm Hannah Deakin Smith, Hannah being my first name or forename, which means grace, which I'm not sure I particularly relate to (laughs) hugely. Uh, My surname's Deakin is my maiden name or my sort of first family name, um, which is again an occupational name, which uh, I think it's related to Deakin officer of the church. Um, And then my married name, Smith, is again occupational blacksmith. Um, So my name on my passport, driving license and everything is Hannah Smith, my married name. And for anything work-wise, I am Hannah Deakin Smith, which interestingly, I changed once I started working with Jane and thought about my own name a lot more. So I sort of reverted to and double-barreled my name. So I'm either Hannah Deakin, Hannah Deakin Smith or Hannah Smith. I answered to any of them. (laughs) Wow. Do you know what? I don't think I've ever um, explored the meaning of of either of my names in such depth. But it feels it feels really how do, powerful is the word I want to use to know the history of your name. Um, yeah. So talking of, of names, uh, both of your surnames seem to link to occupations, um, which is quite interesting. Do surnames mean anything anymore? And the reason I ask that is because if we go into to popular culture a little bit, um, Kanye West uh, has previously said that he changed his name to just Kanye or, or now I think it's just Ye. Um, he doesn't, you know, acknowledge the, the, his surname and even me myself. Um, so I have quite a unique first name and I thought to myself, I, I kind of just want to have that. I don't really care about the rest. No offense to my family members, etc. But I wanted to just keep my first name and that's not really possible in, in this society, I don't think. Um, but yeah, does, does surnames mean anything anymore? Because for me, my first name is, is the most important one. Sure. I think you knocked it on the head there in, in as much as if you're a celebrity of a certain standing, you can get away with being one name, you're like Beyonce, yeah. for example, Madonna, for example. You know, you can get away with that. But even somewhere in the realities of those people's lives, they will have 
documents which <laughs> they've got to have a surname most countries not all of them you know there are variations around the world but most countries particularly in the west will have a requirement that you have a two-part name a forename and a surname so surnames do continue to matter um you know if we again if we go back to um i was talking about occupational surnames you know they kind of derived because people didn't have surnames way back when so you were you were john the pilcher you know that you were you were kind of marked by your by what you did or or john the blacksmith or something so you know that's why there's so many smiths hammer is because there were so many smiths of various sort of occupations like blacksmiths wow um, and it's only really with the development of modern societies, you know, the growth in population that you get with industrialization and so on, the growth in the kind of state and the need of the state to manage the population, to administer the population, the growth in private property. So it becomes important to trace family, families' properties and families' wealth and ownership. It's only really as we get to modern societies that surnames come into play for everybody. Um, you know, so in some ways you wanting to kind of discard your name is like going back to pre pre modern times in some ways. I thought I was being original, but it turns out <laughs> <laughs> someone done it way before me. Um, the study of names is is onomastics, if, if I pronounce that right. Um, That's right. And that means the study of the history and orig origin of proper names, especially personal names. So, Hannah, you mentioned that, you know, you you began to delve into your own name when you started working with, with Jane. What was that journey into to studying this for you? For me, um, I started off looking at international student experiences um, of mobility, particularly and as well as experiences. And that came from I had spent some time studying abroad in my like younger years. So that sort of influenced that. And then continued doing research in that area. Uh, and then the project came up with Jane that was student pronunciation of names and the sort of linked there that I think I wrongly assumed it would mostly be international students that we would be looking at um so went for this job was lucky enough to get it and then sort of became I think Jane calls herself a name nerd so I think I'm going to become <laughs> her sort of uh, honorary name nerd and sort of got more interested in it and um, then continued working on other projects with Jane about deep poll name changes and now another project looking at adoption and names. So sort of started with international students and have now found myself properly in the in the names research world. I love that. Uh, and Jane, what was your journey into this? Because I don't know if, if that is my own naive, naivety I'm about to expose here, but when, when I learned from you at Leicester, names, I remember you focused on age and, and, and uh, gender, but names yeah. didn't, um, didn't, spring to mind also i remember you recommended and i must say this to the listeners you recommended a book that changed your your life was housewife by Anne oakley and since then i, re I read that book uh, and i found it really really fascinating so thanks for the recommendation but yeah i don't remember the names the names connection so so where did that come from no sure so i mean you mentioned um about sociology of age as one of my kind of interests went back when i, I was lecturing you teaching you and, and gender. And it's really those two things that led me to think about um, names, partly based on my own experiences. So as a child, um, my parents got divorced and my mum remarried and she said, oh, well, you can have the, you can have the new surname of, 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 you know, your new stepdad, you know, 11, 12 year old. You think, yeah, OK. By the time I got to 14, I thought, no, don't want that. Go back to my my birth surname. And then fast forward to when I have my own kids, um, you know, partly out of my kind of gender interest, I thought, well, I don't want my children just to have their father's surname. I want them to have my surname as well. So my kids have got a double barreled name, so they're called Pilcher May. Um, and, you know, from it's, that's just, it just got me thinking about names and gender and identity and why is it that women, you know, tend to change their surnames when they marry a man? Um, who it's not that it's not the law that you do that but something like 95 percent of women even today who marry a man change their surname why what does it say about names and belonging to a family and gender relations and gender identities so that's kind of how I got into it as a, as a personal journey um, I began looking at it in terms of you know how do children get their surnames and why particularly when couples aren't married to each other what happens then does it make a difference who you know what what 
surname does the child get? And from there, I got interested in the gender kind of manifestations of naming. And then, as Hannah said, I became a complete name nerd. <laughs> and I've just gone, I've just dived into it completely and find all aspects of it now fascinating from issues around, you know, pronunciation of names and what that does to students' identities, which is one of the projects um, I've worked on, to why people change their names using deed polls, which is a kind of semi-legal way of changing your name, to what happens to names when people um, are adopted or people adopt a child, you know, what kind of naming decisions get made and why in those kinds of contexts when families are kind of being remade through a process of uh, adoption i'm intrigued so you mentioned loads of things there that, that piqued my interest a little bit um so what were some of the findings that, that you did find in terms of parents that aren't married and what, what sort of surnames do the kids take on uh, but also if i reflect on my own experiences i've had two family weddings in the last six months uh one of them um uh they ended up with a double barreled name and my mm. family members looked around the room when that was announced like did you know did, did you know did you know so that was that was quite interesting um and then the other one uh took just the, the male's name um yeah. so it was, it was very interesting to see the, the difference in 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 both of their relationships uh and and the the power transaction if you will um yeah what did you find in terms of parents that aren't married um there's one of the things about names is hardly anyone studies them. I'm, I'm like almost, not quite, but almost the only person doing it in the UK and one of the few people doing it around the world. It's still quite a new area of sociology. But having said that, there is a study in America which showed that, you know, amongst couples where they weren't married, where they'd had a child, 97% of those children were given the surname of the father only. So, you know, children belong to men mm. if, we, if we're using surnames as a marker. Um, and, and women don't kind of own children in the same way through, through, the, you know, through a surname as men do. That's wild when you consider the whole uh, um, 40 weeks worth of work that the woman puts in. <laughs> To That's rear right. said child, yeah, that is very wild, actually. Yeah, um, I was going to mention as well. You you looked in names of regarding the gender. How about culture? Because culture and religion. Because if I get married, my wife wouldn't have my surname; she would keep her dad's. Yeah, um, sure. Have you ever looked into that type of? Thing? Yeah, sure. So, so that kind of gender and gendered naming conventions aren't global. Mm. Um, you know, even in the UK, not all ethnic groups practice that kind of naming convention. And it's really interesting to recognise that what's the, you know, the kind of majority practice isn't the practice for everybody, even in even in one country. So certainly around naming conventions, you have some societies in the world where, you know, some 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 states, I think in Quebec, for example, in Canada, women are not allowed to take their like, legally. They're not allowed to take their husband's name wow. in other in other places around the world. You have to take your you know, your husband's name um, in some religions. You do in some religions. You don't. I mean, I talked about gender and surnames, but, you know, in many countries around the world. Somebody's gender or their sex is indicated by the name that they're given. So Jane is like, you know, typically she would show that the person with that name is, is, a, is a woman or a girl. But other cultures don't have that kind of gender specific naming practices and, and the name can be given equally to, to people of, of different genders. So there is a great deal of variation. A few names like Jordan, like I know like a, a male, yeah, female true. Jordan. Yeah, what, yeah. When did that become a thing, or I don't know. When, when did a name become someone's identity? Like it just proves that they're a male or they're a female. When did that become a thing, or how does that work? So it's hard to trace back. I mean, it, you know, historically, people have wanted to signal. At least, in if we're thinking about the context of, of the UK, people have wanted to signal what what their baby is you know hmm. it's a boy we, we look at people you know we look at a baby's genitals the doctor or, or the nurse will say well it's a boy it's a girl once that kind of declaration has been made about who they are then the par parental parents will make that kind of decision about what to call their child based on the kind of declaration of whether it's a boy or a girl 
So if we look in, 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 in the UK each year, the Office of National Statistics publishes the annual list of baby names based on uh, registrations at birth. You know, you have to go and register your child and you have to put, put your, the name of your child down. That Office of National Statistics list is divided into boys' names and girls' names. They don't do a separate list for gender-neutral names. Right. Because still, it's very strong in the UK that names are given for boys or for girls and there are very few gender-neutral names. Just out of interest then, are you getting any senses that that's going to change anytime soon? I think it is beginning to change, um, but it's not, it's, you know, it's not a trend still. It's yeah. not, it's not like a bang on trend, but, um, you know, there are one, one of the most popular um, gender neutral names in the UK is River, for example, almost equal number of baby boys and baby girls last year who were, you know, they were about. 500 boys called that name and about 500 girls called that name river wow. it's a nice name yeah lovely yeah. You know, it doesn't immediately make you think of a boy or a girl it works really well as a gender neutral name but you know it's it's not it's not a big trend you know you're still going to be pretty much the only kid in your town probably yeah <laughs> called river, river let alone um you know in in your school or in your class so Hannah, if we can come to you, um, what is the link between names and our identities then? Um, I read in, I, th I think it was one of your papers, Jane, um, you can identify, they identify with someone's body. W what does that mean? I think you'd probably better ask me that one. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pass it on to you then, Jane. Yeah. I was going to so, say, I'll just be quoting Jane's paper. Yeah. It's probably best to just go to Jane. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I've made an argument that we need to think about the, the, the strong links that there are between our bodies and our identities and our names. So, you know, Jane Pilcher, you think that'd be, Pilcher's not a very common surname. Okay, it's pretty unusual. Jane's a pretty common forename for people, for women my age, say. You put the two together, you think, oh, there can't be that many Jane Pilchers about. And, you know, if you put me in, put Jane Pilcher into Google, you actually come up with a lot of Jane Pilchers who've lived historically in the past. And, you know, there's a fair few Jane Pilchers around now. So using just my name doesn't identify me as a unique individual person. Okay. okay? What, what identifies me as a unique individual person is my name as it's applied to my body and my face. So you think about how important identity cards are, mm -hmm. okay? So you've probably got one getting in, you need a card to get into work. It's yeah. probably got your picture on it. It's got your name on it too. And it's the combination of the two that authorise your identity and validate your identity. It's the same with passports, for example. So we have to think, I think, not just about names and identity, but about names, bodies and identities as well, because right. that's what makes it work. That's what makes names work effectively as a as an identifier when it's attached to somebody's body that makes sense so i saw on the news was it today or yesterday my days are all in blurred in madonna madonna was yeah. at the grammys the other day and she looked recognizable to me but the headline is madonna looks unrecognizable that's the headline she's still madonna that's the name yeah. the body uh has changed over time is that significant in any way or is that is that just popular culture doing its thing, making a big thing I out think, of it? You know, she's still Madonna. You know, one of the reasons why we why we have to update our passports every what is it, ten years mm. or something, is precisely because we're not going to look the same. You know, our bodies are not going to look the same over time, and so you know, you still got the same name, or you may have the same name, but you know, it's that body name combination that needs revalidating through through our passports. Um, you know, to, to make that passport an effective way of identifying who we are. So, Hannah, if we can we can pick up with you. I know you said your speciality was international names. Now, I'm really interested in nicknaming and international students. I, I've met a few in my time at work who I say, unfortunately, right, and maybe that's my own value judgment on it, but they've produced nicknames to try and fit in because their given name, they have deemed to be too difficult to you know to go forth with sort of thing what are your reflections on that any experience with that any insights 
Yeah, I think with the students that we spoke to, we didn't just speak to international students. We just spoke to any students uh, who had issues with pronunciation of their names. Some were quite sort of traditionally English names that they still struggled with. So it was a mixture. But definitely some of the international students, there was sort of a division where some people would choose a shortened version of their name for ease. And in some ways, one student comes to mind who actually chose a shortened version of their Polish name. And they did describe it as them being able to disguise the fact that they were Polish. They didn't actually want people on first sight of seeing their name, like lecturers, people they were emailing, other students to initially think they were Polish. Um, they hadn't had particularly negative experiences, but they were definitely using that strategy as a way of disguising who they were and their, their identity. So people do definitely do that, but they saw that as quite a positive thing. They were here for studying and they wanted to fit in. They didn't want to have to constantly sort of explain themselves or their name or how to pronounce their name. They used it as quite a positive, empowering thing to do. Um, whereas other students came across, some Chinese students particularly did choose shortened versions or English versions of their name for ease of others. That definitely was the case. And it's difficult because when you would sort of ask people, would you want to be called your real name or your full name? Some of them did say yes and would like that, but a lot of them lacked the confidence to actually enforce that upon people, particularly people in university who hierarchically were sort of difficult to challenge. And so you're getting my name wrong in a group situation at university. So a lot of the time people just let it let it slide and thought you know it's fine as long as they're referring to me as something close to my name mm. we heard that a lot you know I'll just accept it um, but when you talk to people further um, sometimes it does bother them more than they they would let on and would rather be called a real name rather than a nickname or a version that they come up with for ease um, so yeah that is definitely something we've we've come across and also people changing the ordering of their name to fit the cultural norms here and they might not be comfortable with it but they will allow themselves to be referred to it for ease and to fit in so it's definitely something we came across but there were definitely different opinions of it some people wanted to do it and some people didn't really feel comfortable doing it go ahead that's what i pretty much did as well to be honest because i think since school everyone's been saying my name wrong and i just went with it because my name's you're meant to pronounce it as rash rachel but i always got Rochelle, or pretty much Rochelle, and it's not really my name to be honest. Yeah, I never deeped it too, too much to be honest. I feel guilty now. Yeah, I do because I do have a nice name. <laughs> so, but so did your teachers at school get it right? No, they. I literally, I think from primary school, if I, if I, I had the perspective as my my parents are Asian, I'm Asian. There's an Asian way of saying it, and there's an English way of saying it. And to be honest, I feel like if I not put my foot down, but if I told them how to say it properly, probably put more effort of into my name for them to say it. it probably turned around a bit more better, to be honest. But now just having that comment with you there, I just thought about it. I never really tried to tell someone, I'll oh, say my name properly or just I just went with it, to be honest. I said, it's I think a little bit sad now. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think for, for school children, it's, you know, because the status of a teacher is, you know, you know, they're a teacher, mm. it must be quite hard to correct any mispronunciation of name. Mm. And even in our study, we found that students at university, you know, they're, they're young adults, but they still found it difficult to get up the courage and be brave enough to say, you know, actually, that's not how you say my name. This is how you say my name. So it can be a really difficult thing to challenge people, you know, to, you know, pointing out where they're going wrong. And the conversation of how to say it, and then you're there for five minutes yeah. trying to explain this is how you say it. And it's just, I, I think sometimes it could be just a waste of time. So that's why I think since I finished university and went into like professional work wise, just shortened it to rash. Just yeah. straight rash, easy, simple. You can't get that wrong. Well, yeah. you'd be surprised, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hannah, um, so you mentioned it earlier around the, the, the Polish name. I'm intrigued. Is that like a general thing? Do names generally indicate nationality, ethnicity, or is that a quite a, a unique thing? And on top of that, why is that potentially problematic? I think sometimes, yes, some of the students we spoke to did sort of describe their name as, oh, it's a very Polish name or it's a very Chinese name. They they self, they self they thought themselves that their name would identify who they were. Um, some were very proud of that. And, you know, we did come across students who really did say to people, you know, go against that 
uncomfortable conversation of I'm sorry you're getting my name wrong can you people did try to get people to get their name right other students academic staff support staff they did try to get people to get it right um but for other people they did sort of think oh this highlights my difference or that I'm not a, a home student and did sort of not hide behind but um they, they did use that to disguise it so themselves they thought it highlighted their ethnicity and I think in terms of when it is problematic we definitely came across cases of that um one one particular student the, the story was quite shocking really but I think it does happen more than we probably want to admit is that they applied for a job in a bar in London whilst they were studying um so not somewhere you would expect to come across this and they received no reply from their CV, nothing back. Flatmate applied same day, got an interview, got the job within a week. As sort of an experiment, they sent their CV with a different name, an English name, and they got an interview the same day. Mm. And they were convinced that that was why they raised it with the company. They obviously denied it. So I think that is definitely that some of the students did think they had experienced how the ethnicity of their name had been problematic for them mm. and there are other cases of that in the press or in other literature as well that where that does sort of stop people getting jobs or getting interviews because of their name and and what it highlights um so i guess your name give, giving the impression that you're from a certain ethnicity is problematic when somebody negatively takes that on and, and is basically racist or yeah. you know is negative about you because of your ethnicity I'm glad you cleared that up because my question was a little bit clunky. That's what that's what I meant to ask uh, in asking that question. So I'm glad you, you, you teased that one out there. Um, when we talk about that and, and the CVs, um, I, I think instantly back to my A-level days of Noon. There was a study by someone, I don't know their first name, um, funnily enough, but their last name was Noon. Um, and they s submitted however many CVs to organisations uh, with an ethnic sounding name uh, and then submitted the same exact CV, same exact qualifications ex and experience um, with a, a non-ethnic sounding name, if, if that's the right way of saying it. Um, and they received way more interview requests um, for the the Western name, shall we say. Um, wild. And I think, I think one of the critiques of that study when I was doing A-levels was, well, it's an out-of-date study. But it's not our date. It's still our lived experiences. Um, and I'm sure if you did that same study today, you'd, you'd find very similar outcomes. I don't know, Jane, you might want to challenge me on that one. No, absolutely. You're right. I mean, one of the big studies that have been done in, in the UK was a government funded study from the Department of Employment, which did exactly the same kind of experiment that you, you were talking about there, sending out CVs with different names on but exactly the same qualifications, still skill, skills and experiences. And it was definitely found that, you know, people with names perceived to be non-white names did much better. They got more callbacks, they got more invitations for interviews and so on. And so that, that was a 2009 study and people might say, oh, well, that, you know, things have got better now. But somebody just last year or the year before did another European wide version of that of a sim using a similar kind of methodology and found exactly the same. So, wow. you know, wow. it's it's still happening. It's mm, still happening. Sad, out there. And yeah. um, I know AI is used a lot in recruitment now. Um, but I've seen articles that again, even AI, um, which is programmed by human beings at the start, um, has biases um, towards well, exactly, names. Exactly, because it's programmed by human yeah. beings at the start. Yeah. People think AI is this kind of neutral entity, but it's not. Yeah. It's always programmed by typically white male Western, you know, programmers whose biases are going to slip into yeah. whatever it is they're programming. Yep. And you know, it was interesting because you mentioned the, the, the Chinese names, Hannah, earlier. And uh, my girlfriend, she's from Hong Kong. And her, her, she has an English name. Um, uh, she has a Mandarin name and a Cantonese name. But on her passport, it includes her English name and her Cantonese name as a combination. Um, and her parents did that so that she would have an English name and grow up with an English name. She wouldn't have to create one when she was older. It was already you know pre-planned for her um, because they always knew she was going to interact with you know an English education system, etc. So um, it was very interesting when when people like I don't know who to throw under the bus here, but like my friends and family would say to her, I "Is that like?" Is, is that your real name? She'd say, yeah. And she'd almost have to pull out our passport to prove herself and say, yeah, this is name on my passport because otherwise they'd think she would. She had a, a name, a Cantonese name, that, um, she, and she made up her, her actual name, Brittany. Um, so yeah, that wasn't the case. And it was very interesting to see how um, her culture have adopted and, and almost pre prepared for, for this, um, you know, 
interaction. So moving on to, um, you know, my uh, workplace and, and, and your workplaces, um, university. How does this impact your day-to-day? You know, th- this, this onomastics, how does it impact your day-to-day um, working in the university? And what is, what is good practice for staff and students? Uh, Jane, I'll go to you first. Okay, so names, even irrespective of this issue of pronunciation of, of names, students' names, we, this is a thing we looked at. Names matter in universities already. They already seem to matter. So, for example, I don't know if you remember, but way back when you were doing your sociology degree, you had to submit your work with a number and not with a name. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of universities do that in the UK, and that's to rule out conscious and unconscious bias by lecturers when they're marking students' work based on, oh, well, I know that person, you know, they're good, they're good, I'll give them more, kind of more marks. Or, you know, this person's got, a, I don't know, a Sikh name or a Muslim name, you know, unconsciously people might discriminate against, you know, and not kind of take the work at face value because they know who the person is who wrote it. So to that extent, names already matter in universities. And also, if you think about, um, there's often kind of campaigns for reading lists for students to have more women authors and more people of colour, academics of colour on reading lists so that it's not just all about white men um, in terms of their kind of contribution to a discipline. And so names come into play there because, we know, we need to know the name, but we also need to know a little bit about the author. But on a day to day basis, Obviously, you know, students go through university um, in their in their classrooms, interacting with staff, interacting with their fellow students. And I think it's important and I, I think our study shows it's important that they feel like they belong in that learning environment. And if you're constantly being renamed through someone mispronouncing your name, um, or disrespecting your name in some way, deciding that your name's too difficult for them to pronounce, so come up with a completely different name for you, then, you know, that just is not a, a conducive learning environment for you to feel like you, you you belong in that learning space and you're not being othered. So that's on a daily basis throughout a student's um, time at university. We did a survey of universities in England in terms of whether they had any policies about you know, ensuring that students' names get pronounced correctly. Mostly, student uh, universities don't have any policies. So yeah. we came across a few who had policies only at the point of graduation. So, you know, a student might be asked or invited to fill out a form to, to sort of share how their, how their name should be pronounced when they're being called across the stage to shake somebody's hand and kind of graduate in front of all their families and friends. But not, not all, even all universities have that. And I think it's not just important at the point of graduation when a student's basically waving bye-bye and going out the door of a university. I think it should happen from the point of registering at a university, from the point of your induction programme at a university. And all staff should be trained in this issue of, you know, respecting people's names and respecting their identities. And, you know, it shouldn't just be something that's left uh, to the last minute when students are graduating. And there are loads of things that universities could be doing. Um, One of them is to encourage people to record the pronunciation of their name and attach it to your email signature. Mm. So that, you know, we we have now this sort of um, declaration of our preferred pronouns and a lot of people include that in their email signatures. We should have it as a recording of our name Mm -hmm. to declare our preferred pronunciation of our name. And even though my, I might assume that my name, Jane Pilcher, is easy to, for everyone to pronounce, but that's a real, you know, wrong assumption. You know, a Chinese student might not know how to pronounce my name. So I have an audio recording of my name, of me saying my name in my email signature so that people can check before they meet me and, and try and try and say, say my name correctly when they do so. So we need to normalise this kind of practice of including audio recordings to share our preferred pronunciation of our names. That's that's fascinating. I think you said something 
really profound there that made me think um you said renamed so you, you're constantly being renamed when your name is being said wrong and i think that's really powerful because i've never considered it like that but i would never let anyone rename me if they said i'm going to rename you and i'm going to call you this yeah. but in them saying my name wrong they are renaming me and i think yeah. that's that's really powerful um I mean, you might want to let somebody off once, but in, in, <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're with a lecturer over a, a whole semester or even a whole year, and that lecturer consistently and persistently says your name wrongly, you, you, that that's that is renaming. Yeah. You know that that person is renaming you. Now, I, I must say as well, like, so I did get that form at the end towards um, graduation about you know getting my name correct, um, and it wasn't said correctly. Um, it was, it was, I was called K-Van, K-Van Brian, I remember it. Um, and I, I screen recorded cool. it and it's on my Instagram and um, how do I put it? Even in my caption, I believe I referenced the fact that my name is spelt wrong. And even, I think before it was even like part of my, my thought process of how, how graduation is going to pan out. And I did, I'd only in through this conversation right now, am I reflecting and thinking, wow, it actually took up quite a lot of my, my brain space in and around that graduation time before, during and after um, because of my name. Um, now, I'm sure on a uh, in an isolated as an isolated incident that won't impact my well-being or my my my, my life, right? Quality of life. But over time, it's quite a microaggression, right? I, I, I've seen some of your work that suggests that. Hannah, yeah, do you absolutely. want to go into a little bit more more detail on, it, on the microaggression? You know, in partic particularly at um, graduation, you've, you've, you've got, it's like a big rite of passage. You've got your family there. You've got your friends mm. there. For some students, they've flown in their parents from, you know, if they're an international student, they've flown in their parents from abroad. You get like your 30 seconds of fame across that stage <laughs> and they muck it up. Yeah. So, the, you know, we... To be fair, though, we spoke to lecturers as well as part of our studies, some of whom had the job of like preparing to say students' names for graduation. And, you know, they do do their best with the resources that they've been given, but they're just not given the right resources. You know, and it's it's something that these these people who read names at our graduation, they worry over so much and they, you know, they do a lot of background work off their own bat. You know, they're not given anything. Yeah. And it, it's so sort of ad hoc and unsystematic, and in your case, unsuccessful, that, you know, we, hmm. Hannah and I think that something much more kind of focused and um, purposeful needs to happen, particularly at the point of graduation, but as part of a whole kind of package of interventions that a university should do throughout the time of study at a university. This is a brand new, fresh idea that I've literally just thought of as you were speaking. But what if every student introduced themselves during graduation? Not not live, but did a video. Yeah. Saying, I'm, I'm Kavan Bryan. And obviously, I, I, if you have a long course name, that could be a long graduation, right? But yeah. I said a BA Sociology. Kavan Bryan, BA Sociology. And it's a video of me saying that. So then I get yeah. my name right. I'm on the screen and the dean or the VC, or whatever, shakes my hand and, and it's all the, the great pompous and, and the show. But I said my name and I got it right. Yeah, I, that certainly would be a solution. But, you know, there are other ways of doing it. You know, we're in a very technological, high tech world. Why can't the person have an earpiece in and, you know, all people, if, 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 if my kind of idea of having people say their name and attach it to... Uh, and uh, their email and audio recording of the name all that they need to do is gather all those names put them in the order of the person who's going to you know the graduation order and it would just be played just before that person steps on the stage they could hear that audio recording and the person could say the name but you know your solution is another one or what another one that would work you know get the students to say their own names i'm going to give this podcast to the uh, the relevant team and um, we're going to make some changes. We're going to make some waves. It makes, well, it makes some changes, but it doesn't change the point of people saying the name wrong still. Good point. Yeah. It, it still factors that in, doesn't it? So, okay. I'm really passionate as an individual about public sociology because first of all, it helps validate my degree a little bit more. Some, <laughs> sometimes people are like, oh yeah, that's about like minds and, and you know, um, people's you know, brains, isn't it? I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's <laughs> psychology. Sociology, you know, it's, it's a lot more of a discussion. So the more public sociology we can advocate for, the better for me and my, my cohort, I suppose. Um, so 
My question is how much of this work on names, the onomastics, how much of it is important in academia, in sociology, in, in the field that, that you work in, Jane, and how much of it of that importance is, is transferable into our everyday lives? Now, I think I think we've probably answered that question throughout our conversation, but I just want you to spell it out and particularly picking up on the microaggressions and those sorts of things. If you could spell it out, why yeah. this is important, that would be fantastic. Sure. So, you know, we, we looked at um, students' names, um, pronunciation of students' names in higher education. But the, the lessons that we learned from our study, the findings that we had, are applicable to all walks of life. You know, we talked earlier about primary school and secondary school, but even beyond education, you know, in workplaces, you know, respecting your colleagues' names. Um, public facing occupations like teachers, like nurses, like social workers, like probation officers, like lawyers. Uh, police officers and so on, interacting with the public need to have some training in about respecting people's name-based identities. So, you know, this is a our project look to education, but its findings and its kind of policy recommendations are transferable to all kind of different walks of life. It's not something that's just, a, you know, going to make a little bit of a wave in university sector. We're hoping to make waves more broadly. So one of the things I'm doing, for example, is um, I'm, I'm beginning to do workshops, names and identities workshops. So I've delivered one, for example, recently to um, psychotherapists, you know, people who have clients who they'll be talking to about their experiences. And, and you know, for those, that kind of interaction, it's really important that you respect somebody's name because you, you're often, you know, talking in a very intimate way with somebody about their lives um you know and i'm hoping to kind of roll that out more more broadly one of the things that we'll be doing is in in relation to our adoption and names project we're hoping to do a workshop for social workers in part we'll draw upon our pronunciation of names study as well as our particular findings around adoption and names so yeah we're pushing it out there as far as we can I've written to and sent my sort of summary findings to, um, you know, all the kind of key players in, in the higher education sector. So it's not just going to stay within the university sector in terms of my university or just think, you know, just encouraging lecturers to change their practices or people who deal with graduation to change their policies. I want it to go right to the top of the kind of like management of the university sector at a national level to see if they can begin to recognise this as an issue. Because it come, at the end of the day, we're talking about equalities, diversity and inclusivity. This is what this comes down to. And at the moment, the way that names, students' names are dealt with in higher education isn't giving respect to diversity and inclusion. And it becomes an equalities issue. So, Hannah, when we, when we say that it's an EDI issue, um and and you know we focus a lot on names that are mispronounced um why is this important for someone with a a, a simple name and and by saying simple i don't mean to other any other names but my name i would say is simple but people seem to stumble over it but why is it important for for instance a jane or a hannah why is it important that that, that why is this issue important i think it's what jane said earlier is that you assume your name is easy um, you know, I looked at your pronunciation of your name before this podcast because I wouldn't have been completely confident. So, you know, you assume and, you know, when back when I was just Hannah Deakin, I used to get Deakin, Deakin with a G on the end. And, you know, I would think it was such a simple name. How can you possibly get it wrong? Um, you know, my daughter's got really, I think, really easy name, constantly gets different versions of it all the time. So, you know, we assume that our names are easy, but to other people, they're not easy. And I think it's just about starting good practice, because if I come across someone that I struggle with their name and they can see I'm trying to help them get my name right, it sort of takes the the awkwardness out of the conversation that you're saying this is how you say my name right they're more likely to then be able to tell you how you can get you know you open the conversation and I think that was one of the things that we sort of found would be helpful for university staff is just having the conversation you can't get everyone's name right or that we can't teach people to know everybody's name pronunciation overnight but it's having that sort of conversation of 
am I getting it right? Please tell me if I'm not getting it mm. right. Giving people space to correct you. And I think even if you've got a simple name, telling people how to say your name opens that conversation uh, and makes it just good practice and more normalised in all walks of life, really. That allyship is really important. Even if you've got a, a simple name, um, show allyship with those who, who, you know, you know whose name are getting getting mispronounced on a daily basis and, and just have it in your signature, have that... that um, audio version available too because it really helps um there is a fantastic article actually on wonky by farhana chowdhury um, which i'll put in the description below of this episode um it goes into detail about some some options you can do uh both as someone with a a name that often gets mispronounced and someone with a name that doesn't get mispronounced to show that support and and, and um ensure that you don't mispronounce other people's names so i'll put that in the description below um one of the things i wanted to talk about um is names that have fallen in and out of favor and we can have a bit of fun with this uh, well, actually, what I'm about to say next isn't fun at all, but uh, we can have a bit of fun with it moving on. Um, one of my colleagues, when I when I told him uh, that we're going to have this chat about names, he said, please, please ask her this question uh, because um, his name is Declan. Now, as of recently, his name has been associated with Anton Deck. And, you know, that, that comes with its own, <laughs> own jolly connotations and it's all, all, all well and good. However, he said in the 80s, his name was often associated with the IRA. And that pro- posed its own problems for him in, in interview settings, etc. So I'm intrigued. Jane, with your, your, your history name hat on, or name history hat on, um, could you give us an idea of any names that have uh, fallen in or out of favour over the years? Um, yes. The kind of broader context of it is things, you know, do go in and out of being trendy so I said about my own name you know when I was born it's top 10 now it's not even top 100 now for girls yeah so you know there's a sort of natural rhythm I wouldn't wouldn't you know just you know you don't you wouldn't call your child after you know somebody of your parents generation probably you wouldn't want to do that you want to be you want to mark a bit of difference culturally speaking between yeah. your tastes as as a as a younger person and your your parents' tastes or their parents' tastes, so this means that some names do go in and out of fashion. So you know, as you were talking now, I was thinking about Nigel as a name. Okay, I've when, Nigel you know, Farage. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> Nigel Farage has probably given it a bit of a well, good good or bad vibes depending on your on your <laughs> politics. But you know, there's not very many Nigels about. And if they are, they're all kind of Nigel Farage's age. They're sort of in, their, in their 50s or 60s. I've never okay. met a young Nigel, that's for sure. Yeah. Give it another 40 years, though. I reckon Nigel will be back in fashion. Because, you know, you you as, as a parent choosing a name for a child, you were thinking, oh, you know, what's, what's a bit of an unusual name that's not sort of like, you know, not not used so much now. Oh, I've got Miss Nigel's a good candidate. You know, <laughs> so this is why some 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 babies now are being called... Names like I don't know. Let's think. Um, Nelly, you know, back in Edwardian times, Nelly was a popular name for girls. But you know, I didn't know any Nellies when I was when I was a kid. But there are some, you know, babies and and, and child, girl children in primary school now called Nelly. So you know, there are names that become fashionable because they're sort of so unusual and they're old-fashioned, if you like. They're yeah. old-fashioned enough to become fashionable again. So that's what I would I would kind of answer that question with. You know, sometimes there are names that you know are associated with with a you know difficult events or upsetting events, and and an example there would be Katrina. Okay, so yeah. in in, Amer- in America. Uh, Katrina was a reasonably popular name for girls. Hurricane Katrina came along, you know, named after because they like to name storms after people nowadays. And guess what happened to the name Katrina? It got drops. very unpopular. You know, it went mm. off a cliff because of people's associations with with Hurricane Katrina. So, you know, these are some of the factors that lead to names becoming sort of problem names or less popular names over time. Anna, can you think of any any names that you just wouldn't see a young person walking around with today? I mean, it's been a while since I've met a baby Gary. I, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, saw, a, yeah. I saw a social media campaign a couple of years ago now that was like, bring back Gary. And it was like <laughs> getting people to name their babies Gary because they're going to be extinct. I think I think it was predicting in 
sort of a few years there would just be no one under the age of 20 that was called Gary um I'm not sure why because it was very popular at one point but yeah that <laughs> Gary is the one that springs, know, springs to mind yeah yeah, yeah he, um I had a mate uh, in primary school called Gary Gary yeah but instantly it makes me think of EastEnders to be honest but Gary well, the mechanic yeah. yeah the mechanic um I've, I've never met like my grandmother's called Norma yeah I've never met a young one. Norma yeah ever I don't think I will either. Like, or or the equivalent, you know, the, the sort of masculine equivalent of that is Norman. Yeah, Norman, you know, yeah. I don't, don't, I don't know any young Normans. I know, a, no. I know a couple of granddads called Norman. But so that brings us to: if you are a young Norman, a young Norma, a young Gary, email akiandsaltfish at gmail dot com and get in touch and let us know you exist. But also, we are available on social media at Aki and Saltfish on Twitter, as well as Aki and Saltfish on Instagram and before our friends die out before our friends die pod on Instagram too. So make sure you get in touch. Um, so towards the end now, I just want to get your, your vision, uh, both of you on where does this project go next? And I know it's a series of projects, but I mean, names generally, where does this go next for you? Uh, you alluded to it earlier. This is not just a NTU project. This isn't just a, a HE sector project. This is hopefully uh, a public sociology, uh, general cultural change project. So where does it go next, Jane? Just really getting getting the findings out there. Um, the, the pace of academic kind of life in terms of like getting a grant and then, you know, doing the research and then by then you've already got another grant. It means that it can be difficult to kind of keep the focus on, on the research that you've just done because, you know, as, as Hannah and I, have, we've moved on, if you like, to the Adoption and Names project. But so I've got a kind of lot of, lot of balls in the air but I'm, you know, I am really pushing the the students' names project and its findings as as far as I can, uh, both within my own university and trying to get impact in other universities. So, for example, your old university of Leicester. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got a contact there. I've shared the findings with them. And, you know, the senior leadership team, as a consequence of, of, of Han the research that Hannah and I did, have now added audio name badges to their email signatures. They're leading from the top. Brilliant. And they're hoping to kind of get that filtered down across the whole university. So change is coming slowly, but surely. But it is a bit of a juggle trying to kind of run a new project when you're trying to still kind of get, get, the, get the recognition for the, for the previous one. And Hannah, what's the vision for you? Well, I think why more widely, as Jane said, with the EDI focus in universities, I think all universities are so big on EDI statements, EDI promises and commitments for the next five years. This is what we'll do in our EDI promise till 2025 and things like that. I think names are such a not easy, but such a basic part of that. I hope that universities will sort of see what we've done and think this is quite a visible way of actually practically doing something because some of the students and even the staff we spoke to sort of said, we've got this big EDI statement. I'm not actually sure what that looks like. That's not what it looks like from our perspective, you know, some of the students. So I hope that it will be sort of taken on by some of these EDI projects and actually make a practical difference rather than just a a sort of statement on a website kind of approach well let's aim for that if you are listening to this podcast and you are a member of staff at university make sure you send the link to your vc and put it right in front of them and share this knowledge with them because um also jane you mentioned you shared some papers with lester if you could share those papers with me we'll put them in the description below as well because sure. um it's all about that share, sharing of learning um this has been a, a fantastic conversation yeah. that for me has opened up a lot of of ideas in my head about what i can do in my work uh, but also in my personal life because i feel a little bit blunt saying it's kavan uh, <laughs> but I, I need to work on i need to work on saying it with confidence and and, and um you know with strength because it is kavan it is not anything else you rename me. Exactly. Um, exactly. So I will own it and I will claim that. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to get rid of my nickname. Yeah? And I'm going to go back to my full name. What is it? Own it. Rachel. Love that. Mm. And that has been Before Our Friends Die with me, Kavan, and... Me, Rachel. <laughs> Love that. And thank you so much to our guests, Hannah and Jane. Like I said, the descriptions will be... Sorry. The links will be in the description below. Um, this has been Before Our Friends Die in the Aki and Saltfish Digital Network. If you need to get in touch with us, please email akiandsaltfish at gmail.com as well as social media Aki and Saltfish and Before Our Friends Die pod on Instagram. It's been fantastic. I really appreciate you listening. 
Don't forget to share this with a friend and leave us a five star review. It really helps us out. Until next time, take care. And don't forget, by the way, to tune in next week for what? Get to know Jane and Hannah. Take care. See you later.